All right, well, let's get going. Um, so welcome everyone uh, to this uh, panel talk about deep tech investing. We're gonna actually have our uh, colleagues at First Republic gonna give a, a, a definition of what that is later on, but let's first of all start off um, with just the, the agenda, what we're looking to accomplish here and, 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 and uh, just an overview. So the purpose of this, this panel really is to help um, three types of people, those who are um, in the industry who may have a fund to understand what the strategy could be for deep tech, those who may want to get into the investment um, industry around deep tech to learn about what are some of the strategies we're existingly doing, and, and also um, for potential uh, folks who are, have their own startup, I think I go, what's, what is the, in the mindset of, of, of my investors, my potential investors, what do they care about? So this is the, sort of the three audiences that um, we have on the call and we're looking to address um, sort of topics that are relevant to them. Um, I'd particularly like to thank a couple of people up front who helped pull this, this event together. Um, so uh, first of all, I mentioned First Republic, they've been a great sponsor of this event and uh, they're gonna in introduce themselves shortly. Um, Black VC and Women in Crypto are also great in basically what I'm trying to do with this, this event and many others is, is diversify talent into this new industry and having these, uh, these groups uh, and, and their, their allies really bring, bring a more diverse set of people into this, this new, new, um, new market. And then the, the, the final one is Runway. So I could have done this event without the support of Runway and, and actually helping manage the event. So thank you to them. Runway is, a, is an accelerator based, an incubator based in San Francisco. And, um, and, and they have a, a great group of, of companies go through their facility and help them expand, expand and in the area of deep tech and many other areas too. So what I'm gonna do with the first boss is to briefly explain the agenda. So the agenda is, um, is ready to, to describe you know, um, who, are, who, who is going to be here on the panel. We're going to have a poll. A poll is going to be designed for you, the audience, to ask, uh, answer some questions and we'll then come back to your questions. So we're trying to involve you in, in the actual event itself. Um, and then we're going to have, after the poll is initiated, we're going to have three or so questions to the panelist and then time after that to go through the poll and answer any questions you have. So it was really focused on the audience here and trying to involve the audience both directly um, through the Q&A and indirectly through the polling. So maybe we can start off um, with the introductions as we, get, as we begin here. So why don't we begin, um, Anjali, why don't you go first, please? Sure, hi, uh, I'm Manjari Chandran Ramesh. Uh, and I'm a partner at Amadeus Capital Partners, which is a global technology investor. Um, around, uh, since 1997, and the firm has raised over 1 billion of investment and used it to back more than 180 companies. Um, we all share a passion for the transformative power of deep technology and some of the businesses that uh, Amadeus has backed is eye tracking leader Toby, cybersecurity vendor, Postcode, GraphCore, which is the innovators in, in intelligent microprocessors, uh, iGenomics, uh, you know, Cambridge Silicon Radio, which was acquired by Qualcomm, uh, and Vocal IQ, which is acquired by Apple. Uh, myself, I'm an engineer. I did my PhD at Oxford University on a Rhodes Scholarship in machine learning and autonomous vehicles. Uh, I focus on investing in AI, robotics, and quantum technology. Uh, and some of the companies that I have worked with are they say, which is emotions uh, in uh, text, Quantum Motion, which is a quantum computing company in silicon, Ravelin, which uses machine learning for identifying fraudulent transactions, and New Quantum, which is revolutionizing networking of quantum computers. So thanks for having me here, and it's, it's an absolute pleasure. Thanks, Mandri. Um, Chris, and then Harry, and then Denise. Go ahead, Chris. Great, thank you, Ian. Uh, so hi, my name is Chris Kim. I'm one of the founders and co-managing partners of Union Labs Ventures. We are a $40 million pre-seed and seed stage deep tech fund. My partner, Nate Williams and I, we're former operators. We built a residential access control uh, startup called August Home. We raised three rounds of venture and we sold the company ultimately to Asa Abloy in 2017. 
Uh, tremendous number of lessons learned in uh, building a, a, a startup that's not purely software, it's more hard tech. And we wanted to find ways to give back. Uh, Nate joined Kleiner Perkins as an entrepreneur in residence and we were exploring startups and seeing so many companies. And we saw that there was really uh, a gap in uh, the support and uh, networking that was available to uh, deep tech companies at the very earliest of stages. And so we spun out of Kleiner with additional backing from Google Ventures. We've invested in about a dozen companies across food tech, robotics, AI, climate, and cybersecurity. And um, uh, so we invest early and sometimes we'll even uh, co-start firms together. Uh, my background, uh, originally uh, trained in physics, but uh, much to my uh, parents' chagrin, I went into consulting. Hi hey, everyone, I'm I'm founder and managing partner of Science Creates Ventures, uh, which is a UK-based uh, deep tech um, seed fund for $17.5 million. Um, we closed our first fund in, in 2020. Um, we focus on deep tech companies predominantly in, in, in the healthcare space, but we have made investments in, in semiconductors and looking at stuff within energy and material science. So looking at things like cell therapies, proteomics, vaccine technologies, um, to name a few. Um, I myself am a former operator, so I do a uh, chemist by trade with a PhD in chemistry from Bristol University. Um, spun out a company in 2014 um, and was CEO of, of that. Got interested in, in tech transfer in, in, in general and actually co-founded two incubators in, in, in the city uh, for deep tech companies. We have 45,000 square foot of lab space in, in, in Bristol. Um, and that uh, the first company, Xylo, was, was acquired by Nova Nordisk um, in, in 2018. Uh, that moved me over to the uh, investment side of the equation, becoming an angel investor, and then actually progressed over to being a, a, an early fund manager. So thanks, thanks Ian for having me. Great. All right. Thanks, uh, Denise. So, sorry. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Denise Ruffner. I am currently Chief Business Officer at Atom Computing, which is an emerging quantum computing hardware startup using uh, one of the newer quantum computing technologies called Neutral Atom. Um, to date, or since inception, our company has raised $80 million. Um, previously, I've been around the quantum computing industry for a number of years, uh, working at IBM Quantum, working at Cambridge Quantum Computing, and also working at INQ, which recently SPACed. And my specialty is helping companies emerge from stealth mode and getting their first customers and getting kind of uh, overall customer strategy and getting things moving. Um, and uh, I'm a biologist by trade, so a little different than uh, Manjari with physics and machine learning, um, but a nice view on quantum computing from a biologist point of view. Thank you. Great. Well, I think the next thing is we're going to have our, our um, friends over at um, First of Master Public give a quick um, overview of the industry. So, uh, Judy, are you ready just to go do that? Yes, thanks, Ian. And welcome, everyone. Excited that you're all able to join us today. Um, very impressive uh, panel of speakers today. So, um, excited to see um, uh, what's on the table uh, for the next hour. Um, my name is Judy Canelan. I'm Managing Director at First Republic Bank, and my team works with our venture capital and private equity clients, uh, many of which um, have a deep tech focus. Um, in today's market, we see remarkable opportunities for deep tech companies to address the most fundamental needs of society and utilizing emerging technologies to work towards a better future. Today, our panel of experts will dive deeper into deep tech investing and sectors that will be impacted by this space in the near future. Uh, here's a slide that provides further context on what deep technology is. Um, so as you can see here, there's a, a definition here, technology that is based on tangible engineering innovation or scientific advances and discoveries. Market size for deep tech investments have quadrupled from 15 billion um, to 60 billion um, to, uh, from 2016 um, to 2020, and it projects to continue um, increasing. And so 
the, the specific industries here are highlighted, um, but um, it touches on, on many other sub industries like food and agritech and, and food insecurity, uh, which are uh, some of the bigger issues that's facing humanity today. Um, and uh, I think I've touched on all of these points. So I'll turn it over to Ian um, to uh, continue moderating the session. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Judy. So the, the next piece here, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we'll hopefully have everyone be able to see us all at this point. Um, and we'll dive now into the actual, um, the, the heart of, of the event here. Let's get started then. Um, with the, there's, there's really three fundamental questions I'm looking to ask here, and we'll have some ancillary ones from that. But let's start off with um, as a, how is deep tech investing really as 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 a um, as a form of investing different than I suppose other forms of, of um, investment? I mean, there's not not a singular. There's other like software tech investing. So what's different between the deep tech in particular? And maybe Manjri, why don't you take a, a first cut at um, at answering that question? And uh, and then um, and then maybe also Denise as well because I think both of you have some interesting at least uh, that deep uh, sort of uh, academic background to to think about it, as well as practical experience in, in in the industry. So please go ahead. Sure. Um, so yeah, at, at the risk of stating the obvious, uh, when you decide to get involved as an early stage investor in in deep tech, you are typically investing in platform technology. And platform technology, it, it's really rare for it to sit in one market sector alone. Uh, so huge number of, of market sectors. And by nature, it's, it's a game changer. So the good news is that you know, there's a huge technical differentiation, which means it's really not going to be easy to replicate. Right? The, 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 the likes of Uber, you know, those sort of business models, it's easy to re replicate. Your deep tech companies, very, very difficult to, to actually replicate. But because the business does not necessarily start from a customer problem, I mean, even in the previous slide, you saw all of them were technology areas, they weren't necessarily market areas. And because it doesn't start from a customer problem, most deep tech companies use the first two, three rounds of funding towards actually finding that product market fit. You know, first with the beachhead application, and then broadening out to a sector that has a much larger total addressable market. So as an investor, the consequence is deep tech businesses have a much longer time to market and you know, a longer time for return on investment. And not only does that mean that the technology has already had a lot of research investments into it, it means that even once it's become a business, there's a larger capital requirement so when you are investing in deep tech, these are some of the things that you need to keep in mind when you're making your returns model. And actually, just to follow up on that, what is the sort of length of time that you see differences? You know, the typical, as I um, think, think about the average software investor, about eight years. What, what is, what's your expectation on, and maybe historical experience from deep tech investing? How long is a piece of string? <laughs> <laughs> Could be any anywhere. I mean, we, we we've had some that are, you know, I, I would say the, the deep tech software ones that, that kind of do the eight to ten years. Maybe there have been others that have gone on for 15, 16 years. I mean, you you did you take Nanopore, it, it listed on the London Stock Exchange first investment went in 16 years ago. So yeah, it, it takes a long time. And Denise, what's your experience? You've actually been in these startups of um, in in the, these long long journeys. What what's uh, what's um, What's your thought more generally on, on the difference and then specifically on time frame? So these are long journey startups. So it's more a startup based on a vision or based on really the potential of bringing this technology to market. In quantum computing today, it's exciting because we've proven that something that was postulated in the 80s by Richard Feynman can really happen, but the devices are still very small. And so we need to give them the companies, the, you know, the platform companies that Manjari mentioned, we need to give those companies time to mature their technology. At the same time, there are people looking at how to write software for these computers and how to really turn that into a solution that has impact on an enterprise. So these are all um, promising, very promising things, but there is, there is a long timeline out. And so 
I'm always very careful when I set expectations about timing for quantum computing that people understand it's still very much in the infancy. Um, and we're looking at five, 10, 15 years really to have hardware that can do something significant as well as the software that can take advantage of the hardware development. So I know that when we talk to investors, that's something we try to emphasize um, is, is that go away from the hype that you might hear from companies and really talk about a realistic product development pipeline. Interesting. And then, um, and Joy, what, what was, it, from your experience when, um, uh, and as Amadeus is, is kind of a well-known fund in, in this area, what was the, um, um, when you went out raising capital, um, have you always been positioned as a, as a deep tech or, or is this something that, 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 um, that you sort of morphed into? You're, you found a new thesis or what, what, what was the, uh, your own experience in, 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 with, with the fund? Um, I, I think, you know, it, it, it's fair to say, given that uh, Amadeus was founded by Anne Glover and Herman Hauser, Herman Hauser, as you know, is, is, is the co-founder of, of Arm, uh, there was no, uh, no other way of doing it, you know, and, and Herman, uh, you know, he, he'll, he'll always tell, tell companies who he meets, we like doing the really, really, really hard stuff. And it is hard, but that's what's you know fun. We we all genuinely really are, love technology, uh, and so there was no other place that I think any of us would rather be. Hmm. And then, and how about you, Chris? Do, do you have any thoughts on um, the difference between deep tech and 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 just more generally um, venture investing, and 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 how you see that the, the difference between the two? Yes, most definitely. Um, I mean, I think uh, uh, Denise and uh, Andre have covered it uh, very well, um, but I think uh, the, the longer time to maturity, of course, fewer iterations uh, available within a given round of financing. But I think one thing that's uh, also underrated is the very high operational load um, in order to scale your product when you're going to market. Uh, because with software, obviously, each incremental unit that you sell is uh, basically free. Uh, but with uh, most deep tech applications, there's some form of scaling factor, and you run into that going from zero to one, one to a thousand, thousand to a million. Uh, and those are huge challenges. Um, so those are things that uh, we definitely take a look at. Uh, at the same time, um, as Mandri had pointed out, uh, deep tech is generally hard. Uh, so that is a, a wonderful built-in uh, moat uh, to competition, whereas uh, the, entry to bar the barrier to entry for typical software SaaS is uh, relatively low. So there is some you know, trade-off there, but in general, uh, we, we definitely look for teams that understand those differences and really try and figure out how can you incrementally commercialize during that you know, 5, 10, 15 year period as you're going along. Mm -hmm. And Harry, now when you built out these two incubators, obviously you felt there was a need um, to actually have physical um, sort of capability, what what's um, in terms of actually doing the testing? Is that a piece that you felt that you know um, that is a distinct difference in between? Uh, obviously, software can be iterated you know quite quite quickly, but you know, if you're doing some uh, hardware, there's 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 a lot of work there that may, may be done in the lab. Is 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 that a, a piece you think is is unique to deep tech, or is this simply you saw the need for this more generally across all forms of of um, early stage companies, this lab space. How are you One of the key differentiators of, you know, of, of these, it tends to be the, you know, the, the R&D aspect of, 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 of the, the, the product development um, platform development in, in, in the very early stage. And that usually requires some access to high value equipment, lab space, or you know, outsource manufacturing partners to to to, to, de to develop the technology. You know, whether it's come from a, a university setting and, and twenty years of academic research, there's work to do to 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 really build out that technology platform. So it's really important to have translational research facilities close to where the academic blue sky research is being done. Um, and I think that's the case um, in in most technology hubs. You you will see. Um, well-equipped incubator space, um, you know, above and beyond, you know, the, you know, snazzy hot desking areas, they, they have access to really um, hard facilities, um, be that to do your own kind of wet or dry science, whether it's semiconductors, whether it's, you know, material science, you know, you, there's certain health and safety requirements to, to push that technology forwards. 
So it's, it's, it's really important in the early stage to have access to that um, so you can really understand where the edges of the technology are um, and, and, and make sure you, you, you know, you, you've protected it well. And if that's close by wherever it's being discovered, that hugely lowers the barrier to entry and it can de-risk the technology at the early POC and discovery stage. Great. Well, let's move on to another question, Jenny, which is um, you know, the, um, the LP. Uh, and so for those who don't, are not familiar, in, in the venture world, you have limited partners, often in endowments or um, family offices, who invest often in venture capital funds. And venture capital funds, in terms of everyone's familiar with, invest in startups. So the next question really is to, to sort of tease out, um, uh, as you look to again raise a fund, if you want to raise the fund, how do you best position yourself to those LPs, the people who could potentially invest in your fund and invest in this particular area? And um, that's an area which typically is, is not much known about. Um, there are, it's not as well documented you know, how to engage with limited partners, how to get that fund in the first place. So I thought maybe I could ask to, to Chris and Harry, since you both raised actual funds, um, Let's start off with there. Is a what was that process like? Um, were, was there a um, what type of um, of LPs do you go to? Was it family offices? Was it institutional? Um, and then um, how did you find the pitch? And how did you tailor the pitch um, for this longer term investment um, so horizon? So Chris, when you go first. Thanks, Ian. Uh, yeah, this is a fantastic question. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll share a little bit uh, in the initial stages and then how it evolved over time for us. Um, you know, I, I, because of our background as operators uh, and because of our success uh, in uh, building, uh, raising capital and uh, selling a startup and successfully exiting, um, we thought, well, corporations uh, would be a natural fit for us. Uh, we have a lot of relationships and networks there uh, and uh, we can clearly uh, demonstrate some value with them. Uh, and uh, the reality is that it is quite challenging uh, because uh, capital allocators anywhere are always looking for, all right, you were an operator before, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're a, a very good capital allocator. What's the, the real story and differentiation relative to all the other different fund opportunities, our own team's ability to do direct investments, et cetera. So it turns out that there was uh, quite a bit of relationship uh, building that needed to be done, uh, both with uh, the corporates up and down, their hierarchies, as well as with uh, institutions, family offices, et cetera. Um, you are entering into a relationship with an LP that can extend minimally 10 years, if not you know, 14 to 16 years or more. Uh, typical American marriage lasts less than a decade. So you know, LPs are looking at this as an incredibly long-term relationship. They really want to get to know you and have a sense. Uh, can you do this job? Are you trustworthy? And are you going to actually do what you say you're going to do? That's even before you touch on the concept of deep tech. Uh, and as we've already described, the return profiles uh, take a bit more time there. So there was some challenge to articulate and differentiate relative to the variety of investment opportunities they have at disposal. So the way things really evolved is that we really needed to paint a, a very clear picture of the future and a path and a lane for deep tech. Um, we contrasted ourselves uh, with SaaS where building a company in that space is fairly well optimized. There's plenty of books, all sorts of things about how to build. Uh, and uh, uh, with a deep tech, um, what we said is that in order to solve some of the really big problems that are in the world today, whether it's around climate or sustainability or uh, compute and things like that, you need to start taking a little bit more risk and going out into the science areas. And that's where the real alpha is gonna be generated for fund returns. And that's where we started to begin to uh, change the narrative around deep tech and begin to draw LPs in. So it's really around uh, creating the right story, finding the right partners and being able to clearly articulate what that differentiation is, but that definitely took us some time. And do you think because of that, um, just listen to what you were saying, that it, it sounds as though that this is a much um, tapping into an, a, an emotional component um, of, the, um, of the LP to an extent, maybe more so than maybe traditional software investing where to an extent, an LP that understands there is there is um, a defined path, particularly for SaaS, enterprise SaaS, where, where you you have a, a clearer path once you get the scale to get outcomes, um, an exit outcome. 
it, 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 how, how much of the pitch you've touched on climate change and other things, how much of your pitch was on uh, appealing to the um, to, to these broader trends that are maybe not so always grounded in immediacy in, in terms of, um, of, of return? Sorry, I apologize. There was a little blip in my uh, internet connection. So I could you uh, uh, rephrase the question? I apologize. Absolutely. So of your pitch to the LPs, <laughs> how much of it was the narrative of overall policy maybe changes as opposed to financial return pitch, which may be more prevalent when you're pitching enterprise SaaS, where there's a clear fundamentals that need to be hit and there's outcomes which are well understood. So um, I was trying to understand how much of your pitch had that emotional heartstring, the policy-based approach. It's, it's definitely much more the, the policy-based approach uh, because we are first-time fund managers, uh, so it's more difficult to uh, point to an extended track record. Uh, and uh, with deep tech, uh, because it is relatively odd and or, and or fragmented, depending on how you want to look at it, um, uh, it's, it's harder to point to specific uh, you know, uh, stellar outcomes. And so you have to uh, draw uh, the picture uh, towards much, much more towards the future and find the right people who are willing to take on that risk and interested in it. Mm -hmm. Now, Herring, how about yourself? Um, uh, you've raised um, your first fund, as I think, it's to 70 million. Um, you're looking, I think, to raise another one right now. What was the, um, um, that, that journey for you like? Um, it sounds as though you know, Chris was saying that he thought it'd be corporates. It didn't end up being corporates. It sounds as though it was mainly maybe um, family offices. Um, but what, what was your um, experience like? It's similar to that or, or, or different? Yeah, well, I, I think, um... It was it, the, the, there's definitely similarities there. I think as a you know we you know as as, as a as an operator and an exited entrepreneur within within the biotech arena, um, that's useful. Um, but at the same time, does that mean that you can turn your hand to you know being being a great investor? I think there's you know not everybody makes that transition. I think it helped that I had not just done Xylo. I'd also built an incubator. And that was successful. So I ran a successful development. You know, got you know, got hold of a building, designed it, trans raised money, and, and and built a successful incubator. That gave me um, um, a USP around um, you know having a connection to you know very you know a, a very research intensive city, um, and also showing that I'm I wasn't maybe a one trick pony, um, and I think that 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 helps showing that you 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 could more between these things and I think being an investor you've really got to um, do a lot of different things and, and look at things from different different angles that help I quickly realized that you know I knew you know what I was and what I wasn't you know I'm a you know a, a former operator and first time fund manager so you know don't even bother going to institutions it's a complete waste of time um, um, and I think this is usually two routes to getting into venture. You either, you know, worked at, you, you worked at a VC for, for 10 years and um, go set up your own shop or you're, you know, you're an operator and you kind of buy in yourself and decide to, you know, to go, go, go into venture that way. And um, I was the letter. And I think in that situation, where do you get most connections with? Um, well, first of all, go to people that you've already made money. That really helps. Um, they, 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 they tend to help. I want to um, read back people who, who've been successful. So former investors that, 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 that had made a good return from, from, from companies that I'd been involved with came into the fund. Um, and I suppose along the journey, um, you know, you say, how, how did the pitch evolve? It evolved dramatically. I mean, I was going into venture having two years of angel investing under my belt and, and a kind of an idea of, you know, what I wanted to do from the strategy. And as I met, more and more sophisticated investors at ultra high nets and high nets and family offices. Um, they really, the, the, the cornerstone investors really asked fantastic questions and got us thinking and, and the strategy evolved with our, with our LPs um, and um, to the point you know, that we, we, we closed the first fund, but it, it took eight months um, to, to raise the first fund, um, which, is, which was relatively quickly. And I think we were, you know, we were, you know, we were lucky in a way because the whole world switched to Zoom. So I think logistically that made it much easier to raise the fund. Um, and then, yeah, in, 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 yeah, but, but going out to raise the second fund, I think it's going to be, um, be yeah, just, just as difficult, if not, if not more. 
Now, Mantri, what's your um, thoughts on in terms of the, the composition of a um, of a deep tech fund, and in terms of the, the people who who are? Do you think that it's important to to have um, an experience in in um, the fundamental understanding of of some of these uh, the sciences? Um, and an operating experience, or can, can you just be an operator and then extend into, in, into, um, into in, investing? What, what do you think is the right mix that, 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 um, that you think can, can make a good investor? I, I think the beauty of venture investing is that there is no one fixed box, right? I mean, you, you genuinely pick up the profiles of various venture investors and you'll find that you cannot draw a, a pattern. And I think that's, that's actually really helpful because when each of these uh, investors then come onto the board of a company, the, the founder, if, if they have been really good with the kinds of investors they have, they have attracted, uh, they can get all of the skill set around that board table, right? So I think uh, you know, it, it really helps. If you, if you look at the Amadeus team, uh, you know, we have actually not only diversity in terms of the, um, you know, nationality and gender and all those usual characteristics. We also have a lot of diversity in our educational uh, as well as our work experience. And that really helps because some of us you know, really are, are willing to go deep into the technology, read the patterns, read the research papers, uh, whilst, you know, other colleagues have come from an accountancy background phenomenally good at, at the modeling side of things and you know so it, it becomes a real team effort both within the fund but also you know when we're able to help with our networks for for the companies it's just so good to have that diversity oh, that's great now denise you've um sat in the seat of um someone who's been the recipient of this these uh this, the money from these venture funds what do you think from the deep tech perspective is you expect from the funds to help you, um, um, and maybe you can uh, illustrate, maybe um, if you want some examples of where it worked well for you, how 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 some how some deep tech investors actually really helped you you out at, at the some various companies you were at. Uh, good question. It, it's been really amazing having been at three venture back companies. How the different uh, the boards have been from company to company, and. Um, I'm really delighted, and I'm not just saying this, I'm really delighted by the Atom Computing Board. Uh, the board meetings are very supportive and they're trying to help us be better. What would happen if we did this? What would happen if you did that? So they're really good at helping us come up with new ideas and solutions on how to innovate or how to be smarter and how to draw on their experience um, in the past. So I found, in, in Atom Computing for it to be a very collaborative environment with the support of the board. Um, so uh, for me, that's been the most important part is really getting um, their ideas and, and having them call me separately and say, what can I do? How can I help you? What about this? So it, it's been great. Um, I will also say that I love technical people on the board. Manjari is not on our board, but um, the technical insights that she brings to a company, I think are really important. And uh, so I just want to call that out as something I also think is very important for any emerging company. Very kind Great. of you, <laughs> Okay, well then let's finish up. Um, which sectors you know, in this whole you know, broad deep tech area do you think would be most impacted um, you know, by, the, by deep tech and what, what um, sectors in the economy um, let's say, let's say in the first you know, five years and a relative medium term, and then furthermore, 20 years out, what are, are there some sectors that you think are, um, we will be unrecognizable because some of these technologies coming down the pipeline. So let's just go around, around that. And um, uh, Harry, when do you go first? I think in, in, in the short term, I, I think it's healthcare. I think, I think that's already starting to happen. I think you look at kind of um, the cancer market with cell therapies you know, is it's swelled from like 10 billion to 180 billion or something like that. Um, and that's that's starting to work now. And there's loads more innovation coming into healthcare and miniaturization of point of NGS technology. We've heard nanopore, that's all starting to work now. Um, and it's really the cost of that's come down to the point we can start doing PAC 
medicine has started to absolutely transform the whole healthcare journey. Um, and I, th I think that's really going to ramp up in the next five years. In the longer term, I think it's energy and transportation, which are going to be absolutely transformed. Great. Uh, about you, uh, Chris? Sure. I think uh, uh, quite similarly, I think uh, transportation and logistics, um, I think uh, uh, we problems. Sorry, Chris, we're having a hard time hearing you. Are you able to hear me now? Yes, that's better. I think it's just the video and audio was, was harder. Audio is great. Apologies. Uh, yes. So, I mean, I think uh, uh, on the logistics side of things, uh, we've seen challenges within supply chain, uh, both due to labor as well as uh, geopolitical constraints. And so I think there will be huge transformations in automation, particularly in robotics, uh, as well as electrified transport. Um, I think uh, on the uh, consumer and uh, regular people sort of transport side, we're already seeing the electrification of things as well. Um, even though uh, autonomous vehicles have uh, and probably will not appear on the scene for quite some time, I think that uh, the continued advances on both compute uh, as well as uh, software advances in AI uh, will have, uh, um, they will find more traction within specific vertical industries, whether it's trucking and things like that. So I'm, I'm pretty bullish on uh, where transportation and logistics are going to be impacted by a lot of the advances there, uh, ranging from material science, AI, and electrification. Great. Now, Mandri, you do have cover something different than logistics and transportation. So thanks you to come up with. Uh... <laughs> I, I, I'm going to say, I'm, I'm, I'm going to sort of say, I think, you know, AI is, has now been, you know, yes, overused a, a lot. And in quite a few sectors, it, it has become a bit of, you know, table stakes. But I do think, you know, in, in the next five years, analysis of data and using you know, sort of, uh, artificial intelligence in sectors that haven't actually seen this happen, like, like for instance, you know, food and beverages, they just, they don't use data at all. Can you believe it in this day and age? So it, it's those sort of sectors, I think that, that is really going to, going to be disrupted in the next five years. But then later in, in, in the next decade or so, I would certainly say general, you know, uh, intelligence, not not general artificial intelligence, where really we are looking at the uh, Turing test being, you know, working right in front of our eyes. Uh, and of course, you know, quantum uh, technologies, it, it's going to be difficult to predict when the actual time is going to come, I think, uh, for, you know, commercial scale systems, but certainly in the next 10, 15 years, quantum is also going to really, really disrupt the world. Well, Denise, that seems like a perfect segue to, to yourself. What, what in industries do you think are going to be unrecognizable in five or, or let's say 20 years from now? So, of course, I'm going to be bullish on quantum computing. And I do think that it has the propensity to impact just a wide variety of industries in various problems. And I, I think the speculation always is, is what industry or what solution will be the first to show impact. And that's something I think the whole industry is waiting to see who can write the best software on systems that we have today that are on the small side and get some commercial impact. So that is still to be determined. Um, I will say that I think the biggest investments in quantum computing in terms of building software teams are right now in um, chemistry uh, we have Polaris QB also on the phone, who's doing some really great chemistry work, uh, and we, as well as um, a lot of work being done in finance. All the major banks have quantum computing teams and are working, investing quite heavily in developing this technology. And then finally, we're also seeing a lot of uh, work done in aerospace with the airplane manufacturers. So whether these are the three industries that are going to show the first advantage we don't know um, but there's certainly a lot of investment and a lot of talent um, going into those industries and so um, i saw some questions in the chat here let's just open that up and just uh, see how we have who we have here going on um, <clears throat> so uh, there's one from rob um, what are the thing what are the things that you look for in investor pitch decks for deep tech investments that are distinctly different 
from investment pitch decks to closer in non-tech. So it's the investor pitch decks. Okay, so this is for, um, I suppose, Harry um, and Manjari, maybe you, you guys kick it off first. Yeah. Um, like, what is it in a, in a prospective uh, startup coming to you asking for funding? What is it you're looking for maybe in that section? No, let's assume everyone has, I know, market size, fit, team, so you know, all those things. What what do you think is is uh, should they have additionally in that investor deck? So, uh, um, majority, when you go first. Oh, it's fine. Uh, I think Harry was going going first. You go you go first, and then we'll go Harry. Okay, fine. Sorry, um, sorry, Harry. Um, so you're you're right. You know, most most pitch decks, whether whether it's deep tech or not, it's it's going to be team, market size, and differentiation. I think where it's it's different in, in a deep tech investment is really the technical differentiation and what kind of protection does that have? What kind of strategy is there that that the company can keep that technical differentiation for as long as it possibly can? Um, I also think you know not every every company is a candidate for venture investing, so you know if the market size genuinely right you as a founder one might feel that this is a really large market it, it is after all you know a, a few hundred hundred million but that usually means that the economics for a fund doesn't quite work and so it's really the the very large market sizes that makes most sense for uh, deep tech investments and so you'll find most people look at a really large market size Okay, uh, Harry, why don't you take a crack at that one? I mean, I would agree. I think I think the, the thing that's I suppose really irritating is is um, if it is a deep tech company, you know, what is the technology? And we're often, you know, someone saying, you know, this is a big healthcare problem. We, we, okay, great, we know there's a massive opportunity. What is the technology? How does it work? And what is its lineage? Why, you know, what's the story behind it? What have you used that means that you've discovered something that the world has not seen before? And and what what are the edges of the boxes of that of, of that technology? And then coming back to um, you know how have you protected that? And what do you need to do to protect it further? And what's going to stop anyone else coming through behind you? And have you have you created that that moat? Now it's one of the first things that we look for, especially at seed and pre-seed, because that's all you start with. Um, and then of course that you move on to you know the team and um, the other aspects of it. But largely those things can be can be fixed if it's a great technology you'll find an excuse to do it um mm -hmm. and and I, then i think depending on how good the technology is depending on how much you're going to roll roll up your sleeves and, and pull, pull it together for the academics whoever is coming to the table um and that then comes back to the second point of you know is it really you know have you just found a you know a room temperature superconductor and um you know going to transform the energy energy industry then awesome and yeah and quantum industry everybody so we'll you know at that point you know it could be the most rambling 60 page deck that's completely you know not talk, even talking about the market opportunity and we are super excited about those sort of things so we're but we're off, off though because we're technical we're, we're very much technical focused in the early stage um and the more polished there is um the more skeptical i am uh, interesting now chris i know that it's it's common for quite a few decks i've seen where they have um, um, the, the good and the great type <laughs> sly where they have their larger group of advisors. How important do you take the um, a advisory board um, and uh, as a form of credibility to to uh, as uh, on all the decks, the uh, slide decks they put? Do, do you think that's important to you? Uh, let's see. To be honest, generally no. Um, I I do pay attention to it uh, to the degree if it's. Um, uh, if I see a path to commercialization there, uh, because that particular uh, board or uh, has either unique understanding of markets or can help them uh, forward there. But I generally expect the team uh, to have a, a really good, solid understanding of the technology and the science uh, and or some track record of having figured out how to pull together people, whether it's advisors or, you know, uh, throughout the larger academic community on how to solve those problems. But the biggest challenge we've seen at the pre-seed and seed side has been uh, selling and commercialization. Uh, do they have a, a logical path there? And that's where I would index a little bit more heavily on the advisory board. Okay. 
Um, okay, I have another question here. Um, this is from uh, Prachi. Um, Given the uncertainties of how quantum heart of quantum hardware, how do you convince investors when the ROI on quantum startup will go beyond the lifespan of most funds? Denise, this is almost perfectly designed for you, this question here. So it's time frame for development of hardware and longevity of fund. So uh, there's a couple answers to that question. Um, one of them it is the appetite of the fund in terms of what their return is and how soon they want to return. And some funds have longer appetites than others. Um, I think also there is revenue to be had in quantum computing even before the systems reach, I'm going to say fault tolerance or some very far off goal. There are many companies that have small quantum computers and are bringing in revenue um, for people who are doing experimentation. So I think there is some revenue in the short term, um, but you're correct in the question that the revenue, the major revenue is generally much further out. And it, it really is very specialized on what the firm is willing, um, how the firm looks at the investment. All right. Another question here. Um, so this is um, from Maviu. Um, so what questions do you have for founders to determine how likely they are to succeed? So I suppose this is this is um, you know, from a point of view of, um, of of Chris maybe and uh, and Jerry. What, when you're what are the signals um, when someone walks into pitch to you to have to, uh, to to have a sense of that they they are likely to be successful? It's a, it's a, it's a massively weighty question because there's so many different stages of success, but let's just start off with that initial interest to have from the first meeting to the second meeting. What, 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 what gets them to that second meeting? I think, uh, so the, the initial bar uh, for me is like, uh, do you have something interesting from a technical and scientific standpoint? Uh, I, I, I tend to pretty much geek out on that, um, but that's also, uh, I think in some ways a deadly trap for me uh, because I can get so easily distracted by it that I have to be very cautious about uh, falling in love with the technology that doesn't have a path to market. Uh, the thing that really gets me to uh, that second stage is if I have some founder uh, in front of me who can answer my technical uh, questions and help me understand what is unique and differentiating uh, about what they've built there, um, but have also demonstrated that they've really thought about how to bring this to market. Um, even if it is something in the quantum space, they've they've thought through what are those, uh, uh, what's the short-term hook that's going to get me interested and say, oh, okay, there is a path for some form of commercialization or revenue within a reasonable time frame, but then they're also pitching me a much, much larger vision uh, because the stereotype with a lot of uh, uh, pure academics uh, coming out and, you know, saying, hey, I want to take my research and commercialize it is that they are super strong on the technical side. They have relatively naive perspectives on how to bring it to market and naive assumptions on how long it's going to take. So if you can convince me that you are not only technically competent, but that you have done some level of homework, uh, given that you're generally a PhD and someone who's exceptionally intelligent, but you have done some level of research and how to commercialize that or what that path might look like, that's very, very interesting to me. So I, I would completely agree, agree with Chris. Uh, I, I think the, the one comment that I would add further is, is quite often, you know, I, I've come across technical teams where the uh, technical co-founder, you know, it's brilliant technically, can really understand the technical side of things, make you make it understandable to, to anybody, even you know, the child on the street. And then they usually partnered with someone who supposedly brings the commercial aspect and so what that means is they have not really done their homework in in looking at the commercial side because they kind of feel that's not my area you know that, that that's something that the commercial ceo needs to needs to look at no when you're a founder it's everything is your area you kind of need to understand that all of that and so commercial ceos also need to understand quite a bit of the tech of you if you're planning to be the CEO of a business. Uh, and the second part is, you know, when I say the so-called commercial person, um, they, they're not necessarily um, as, as good as the technical founder. And then we start to hear a lot of numbers in the air, you know, oh, this thing will reach the market within the next two years. 
And guess what? We'll jump from 1 million to 10 million revenues in the next two years. And, and that's sort of, you know, lovely numbers uh, that, that usually have been picked out of the clouds. Definitely ring big alarm bells. So I, I think that the team just coming across as being credible, having done their homework, having just practiced their pitch makes a huge difference. Well, that's great. Uh, thank you. Now, um, are we ready to move to the poll or um, um, is, is that a good, good uh, are we there yet? Just two more minutes. Okay. All right. Then I have a, a question. I suppose though, um, since we have people from um, uh, Europe, um, investors, um, and I'm also from the US. Now, um, I've heard, I mean, from my experiences that, that deep tech companies typically raise less money at lower valuations in Europe than they do in the US. Is that um, appetite for on the investor side? Is it the um, down to the aggressive nature of of, um, of the in, um, of, of of the actual founder, um, or there's something else going on. What's the reason why um, there seems to be lower valuations and and and, and lower rounds in um, in Europe? Harry, then then Chris. I just think it's uh, uh, there's less money. It's, it's just a depth of capital. I think I think there's there's there's, there's more uh, capital that is available for these types of investment in, in into venture. I think that is changing though. I think you know, things are coming, the frost in the US market is coming down a little bit at the moment. And I think the differential is is, is closing closing slightly, but I, I think it comes down to a depth of capital. So the, the fact is there's funds with more money that can follow for longer and longer and, and, and therefore that equity journey can be different because um, the later rounds are valued at slightly more. So it, it comes down, it comes down to um, those factors, I think. But you can't I mean you can just go over to the US and raise money. In the US, so it's not that much of an issue. Chris, thoughts on, on that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think uh, I, I can comment much less, obviously, on the European mindset, but I feel like in the US, um, uh, th this is a little bit more subjective, but I, I tend to feel like that there is. Uh, more enthusiasm and optimism in some ways. Uh, there's a sense that when you're seeing, uh, you know, uh, 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 somebody attack a problem in, you know, I don't know, warehouse automation logistics with some novel new robot technology or something like that that can now grip and, you know, has force feedback and what have you. Um, there's a sense of optimism, like, yes, this can totally happen. This can totally be done. I know people at Walmart or I know people at Best Buy who would totally use this and leverage this uh, capability. And there's a sense that, yeah, this could be really, really big. Uh, and I think combined with, as Harry said, the availability of capital, there's a desire to really pile in on some of these opportunities. Um, that said, this could be, you know, again, highly subjective. We've seen a lot of SPACs, although that craze has uh, diminished significantly, uh, and there could be sort of a, a reversion to more normal valuations uh, in the, uh, months, if not years to come. Also, we're, we're going to send round after the event, we're going to create a report actually, it's a two, three, four page report um, of this event, which takes into account the, the registration information provided, the polling data, and then the, this transcript. So uh, it's going to be uh, uh, we in like a month or so once we will finish. So let's uh, ask one more question here and uh, to wrap it up. Um, Okay, so I have here a question from William. Okay, William Potts here. In the software universe, there are these wisdoms of fail faster and pivot, 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 pivot. In deep tech, it would appear that the opposite mantras should hold. Persist, 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 and don't pivot. Um, that's interesting concept. Is this a fair assessment or is, it, is, or is pivoting to be encouraged? So um, <laughs> pivot or not to pivot, um, uh, Manjari. That is the question. Um, yes. <laughs> I, I think, I, I think it, it, it's a real balance. Um, I, I, a lot of my deep tech companies have indeed uh, done the pivot. It's, it's not that they haven't. Um, you know, they go after a particular market. It doesn't quite work. They didn't realize it was going to take that long. This other market was, you know, an opportunity that came knocking on their door. So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that it, it's a mantra of persist, 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 and, and don't pivot. Uh, I think it just things just take longer with with deep tech. I think you know when, when you are when you're doing uh, when you're starting from a, a customer problem and trying to create a solution for that, 
um, it becomes a little bit more apparent more quickly if something's not working. And so you, you, you quickly move to the next problem, whereas you started from the technology. And so you kind of need to go through that, that journey. Um, having said that, you know, it, it's really, this is where it, your, your board, your advisors, uh, all of those matter because they will be able to, you know, be able to find that you need to pivot at this point, not don't waste any more time. You really need to drop this market and, and go to another market. Okay, great. Uh, Harry, what's your thoughts? Um, well, um, as someone who's pivoted um, with, with, with my own company, we, we started with a glucose sensor and, and then ended up going to, to Smart Insulin, and that's what we were required for. And then we spent another company, which is now doing continuing glucose sensing. But I, I would say really this, this whole kind of pivot, pivot, pivot comes from the differences in, in, in the businesses. And um, as Manjari said, um, you're generally building a platform to which you then launch a product. Whereas with software, you are just building a product on a known platform. So the pivot, pivot, pivot comes from make product, test, doesn't work. And, and, and this whole idea of find product market fit, and then you hit something and you go, oh, wow, we've got a widget that, you know, we put energy in one side and more energy comes out the other side and we just, we can we can build that faster and scale it. So I think that's where it comes with, with deep technology. Obviously you're building the platform and then when you find the edges of the platform, you've then got to work out what's the first product, the second product, the third product. So you usually have one or two different options. And at that point, you, you start testing the water, you build advisory boards, you bring on the relevant commercial advice. It, say you're going to take this new material, you're going to go after aerospace. You, you, you bring in that and you try and steer it that way. The, the thing is, is you have less, the, the cost of pivoting is higher and slower. Um, so you've got to be a probably you probably get less tries at pivoting is probably the difference um because of the you know the development cycles of, of the product and you're then bound by you know the laws of physics on the platform that you're developing well that's good and i think it's a good uh, way to Sorry, end this. good well thank thanks harry it's, i think good a good way to end um uh, thank you everyone uh, the panelists in particular for us spending some time to 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 share with them insights here and thank you for the audience and as I mentioned just a moment ago, we will be sending out shortly the, um, the report um, and, the, and the reporting results. So thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of the day. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thank you, Ian.